Hello and welcome to The Hearing, I'm John. And I'm Scotto. And before we get to this week's movie album, sorry, um, <laughs> little experiment, uh, we were talking about this during The Hearing, we reviewed um, Reign of Fire, and there is a scene that uses Jimi Hendrix's song Fire in an, an offensively on the nose way. <laughs> so I, I, I made a joke about the Dennis DeYoung cover in my sponsor, and Scott has never heard the Dennis DeYoung version. So no. we're going to have him listen to it live on the show. We we, set the, we decided to do this on the hearing because it's the music show. Um, if you've never heard the Dennis DeYoung version of Fire and you would like to take part in this to have an understanding of what Scott is ranting about, it's on Spotify. You can probably find it on YouTube as well. Cue it up now. Uh, we'll wait. Okay, so this is from 1983. Huh? Mm-hmm. All right, I'm going to hit play. Well, right? pause, pause. I want to make sure everybody's all lined up. On okay. three, hit play. Okay. One, two, three. Okay, so there's... He turned it into a blues song, huh? Kind of, but an incredibly Dennis D. Young blues song. Yeah. Oh, is it just an instrumental? No, no. It, it's There's a long break in the beginning but yeah wait till wait till the vocal comes in oh here he is oh jeez fuck (laughs) oh my god why why would he do this (laughs) I mean The way he's delivering the vocals uh-huh. that had so much soul in them originally. It's um It's the musical theater version. Right. Exactly. I mean he is high school the musical yeah, before right. high school the musical happened. Bear in mind I haven't heard this version of the song in probably thirty years, and it's still burned into my brain. I mean it just and who's playing the guitar with him anyway? Because he's I don't not a guitar some player. player. I I just don't understand why he would do this. Mm-hmm. Unless you're a guitar player yourself and it's your solo album. No, he's a keyboard player. Right. He's I think he doing... plays probably plays a little guitar, but he's certainly not playing lead on it. Moving okay, on? I I got to tap out. Yeah, moving on. <laughs> Like I said, let me stand. Let me stand. Worse let than you stand. Meant. Worse than you thought it would be. You could just—I mean, the amazing thing is you can just hear the stiffness mm-hmm. in his vocal delivery. Yeah. Just the absolute opposite of Jimi Hendrix. Just yeah. move over, Rover. <laughs> let Jimmy take over. To let me stand. <laughs> he wrote Mr. Roboto for a reason. I mean, you could just hear the tension in his, like, neck muscles Mm -hmm. while he's belting this out, and it's just... It's heinous. On to something far better. This week's album, from 1999, Happy Bivouac by The Pillows. The Pillows are a Japanese alternative rock band best known for providing almost all of the music for the 2002 anime OVA series, Fully Coley. The only music in the series that isn't from the Pillows is Comedian's Gallop, an orchestral piece composed by uh, Dmitry Kabalevsky from his 38 suite, 1938 suite, The Comedians. Uh, the Pillows were formed in 89 by bassist, bassist Kenji Ueda and, drum, and drummer Shinichiro Sato, who had both left the band Kenzie and the Trips. Uh, the pair invited uh, Coin Locker Baby's vocalist Sawao Yamanaka to join the band, but since Yamanaka was not able to play guitar well just yet, um, they also asked um, uh, um, Yoshiaki Manabe from the, the hair metal band Persia to join them. Um, Ueda left the band after their second album, 1992's White Incarnation, um, over musical differences, and they've never officially replaced him. Huh. Um, all three bassists who have played with them since then, uh, Tatsuya Kashima, who played with them for six years, June Suzuki, who played with them for 16 years and plays on this album, and their current bassist, uh, Yoshimori Are, uh, who's been with them since 2015, have been credited as guest musicians. 
Oh, that's weird. Dude leaves the band over musical differences still with us today, as far as I know. They never replace him. It is the most Japanese thing I've ever heard of. Hmm. Happy Bivouac, uh, officially titled Happy Bivouac on the Hillary Step, which is a was a um, rock face on near the top of Mount Everest that has since been destroyed by an, a, an earthquake, um, is the band's eighth album. Eighth? I need to recheck my math on that one moment. I think it's their sixth, actually. Oh, it's their eighth. I forget, forgot a couple. Uh, it's their eighth album. Marks the debut of bassist Jun Suzuki, and it's one of the three Pillows albums from which all of the music in almost all the music in Fully Coolie was taken, along with the two previous albums, Little Busters and Runners High. Uh, in fact, there are only three Pillow songs on the album, on the in the anime rather, that aren't from one of those three albums. Stalker, which is from uh, Please Mister Lostman, the album before Little Busters. Uh, right on Shooting Star, and I think I can. Both of those were written for Hopefully Coley. Um, interesting, well, side note, um, Stalker from Please Mr. Lostman, one of the heaviest songs they ever did was on a pop album. Mm. Lostman, aside from that song, is basically a pop album. Um, Happy Vivac was released on December 2nd, 1999, on King Records, produced by Zin Yoshida, and features Subao Yamanaka on guitar and vocals, uh, Yoshiaki Manabe on guitar, Shinichiro Sato on drums with guest musician Jun Suzuki on bass. From this point forward, I will be referring to Sato and Manabe by their nicknames um, Shinchan for uh, Shinichiro Sato and Pichan for uh, Manabe. Um, Chan is a Japanese honorific um, used for either small children or close friends. And um, Pichan, he was nicknamed because um, friends thought he looked like Snoopy. Alrighty. <laughs> um, reminder, I don't edit any songs into our episodes for copyright reasons, but down in the description, if you're watching this, if you're listening to this on YouTube or on our blog at johnscotto.com, you'll find a link to Happy Vivoac on, on YouTube. It is not on Spotify. I found out a couple of days ago that there are some Pillows albums on Spotify. This just isn't one of them. Um, right. This is kind of hard to, uh, mm. to get the three listens into because it wasn't... Yeah, streamed. And we also find a translation of the lyrics so you can follow along with us and also along with what's being said on the album. On to track one, Happy Vivoac. I have to say, this album is another one of my Desert Island discs. Um, by the way, Bivouac is a temporary camp without tents or yeah. cover used especially by soldiers and mountaineers. I did not know when I first heard the song. I had to look that up. Um this is one of my favorites. I love the riff and the interplay between the guitars, between the verses, even in during the verse. Um, it's very nicely composed. There's great kind of occasional Leslie guitar over on the left. Um, I think it's so wow. Leslie's a rotating speaker. It's this real uh, serious arena rock, you know? I mean, mm. it. Um, you can see a lot of the 90s influences they have, like um, Presidents of the United States of America, um, Everclear, The Pumpkins, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, Cheap Trick. Well, Corgan was influenced by Cheap Trick, right. too. So, um, Cheap Trick have often been referred to as the American Beatles. Um, I kind of see pillow, the pillows as the Japanese Beatles. Uh, it's kind of funny because uh, Cheap Trick, this is kind of like them returning the favor, because Cheap Trick, that, that whole um, that live album that they did back mm -hmm. in the 70s, yeah. that uh, sounds like they had this crazy, insane audience. Right. Uh, they were nobodies, but they mm. went to Japan to play. Budokan, yeah. Right. And so it was, and he's speaking in this slow, like, English, so the audience can understand what he's saying. You know, mm. That's why the intro is, I want you <laughs> to want <Right>. me. <laughs> you know? And they just went nuts over him, and they broke because of that. Right. You know that that album. People heard it and were like, "Wow, these guys, these guys kick ass live." Listen to that crowd, and yeah, it was just. So this is like them putting it back, you know, yeah. to us. And um, at this point, um, the pillows were just starting to break. Fully Holy is really what gave them a, the big push. Um, Which is weird because I never thought the music really went with the cartoon with, with, with the with the story you know it was well, kind no, of it doesn't um it was all pulled from albums aside from two songs that were written for it um and they were actually I saw a short interview with the pillows recently talking about that um yeah 
they were saying that you know they would have they actually in hindsight they were like they were a little rude to the creators of the anime because <laughs> they didn't really see their music in a, in a show or in commercials or anything to them well, right. it was just you know write an album record it tour like even mood wise the music doesn't really fit with that but then again there were that was i always thought that was very disjointed the, well, that's the, kind of the whole point really of cool. um, yeah <laughs> but back to back to heavy bivouac um love the solo it's very beatles um Great vocal harmonies. I love the inflection on yes, happy bivouac. Um, the lyrics are about are kind of analogizing life to a mountain. Um, and at the end, uh, he's, he's, the last line before that yes, happy bivouac is how there is no summit. You know, there is no goal in life. I mean, just my enjoy only distraction the uh, from him is his voice, actually. Like, it's very, it has a very weird owl tone to it. <laughs> You know, that very high, high voice. His voice kind of changes throughout the album on different songs, That's especially true. in the last one. Um, on to track two, Rush, not about the band. Um, <laughs> and that's something I need to point out on this album. Um <laughs> Love Although the there sound. Is a song, there is a song later that is... That's why I say I need to point it out. Um, but not this one. Um, love the sound of the opening drum break, loaded with reverb. Shin is very Ringo influenced. Um, I mean, this is a very grunge yeah. uh, song more than anything else. It's a bit late for the grunge boat, but I think yeah, they did enough sonically to make it worth it. Yeah. It's great wall of sound, which is normally not my thing, but I think it works here. Um, the entire vocal is harmonized, which just makes it feel huge. Um, love the aggressive distortion on the right when in the chorus and the turnaround. And the feedback, and there's these feedback beeps right before the solo. Um, just a big, loud, chaotic rock song to fit the lyrics, which are really just kind of about experiencing life. And so, I mean, I hear this, and I kind of get pissed because I think of what was popular in the late 90s, early mm -hmm. 2000s, and just, I mean, it, it's what led to, like, Limp Biscuit and then, like, Nickelback and all that. And here we have this that didn't sell anything here, really. Well, because like, it's from Japan and mostly in Japanese, so it's not going to sell anything here. Yeah, but, you know. Music in other languages does not sell here. It, you, you get those every now and again that, that something goes over well. I mean, Baby Metal was language. big for about 10 minutes as a novelty, but that's about it. Baby Metal? Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah, I remember that now. They were okay. big for about 10 minutes as a novelty <laughs> over here. I had to think of that. Oh, yeah, that's right. The dude in the, in the diaper. Yeah. No, that was, um, that was Lady, oh, what is it? Lady Beard. Lady um, Beard? Lady Beard. Um, that was an, it was another Kawhi Metal band, the guy. Um, Baby Metal was the three girls. Oh, okay. Um, they they played a bunch of talk shows over here, toured a bunch of places. They were big for about 10 minutes out of novelty. Um, on to track three, Last Dinosaur. Love the giant low-tuned snare uh, that just takes your head off. Um, it's about a monster, um, a, a dinosaur or kind of a Godzilla monster, used really just as an analogy for loneliness and despair. Um, love the rage in the vocal. Some really nice acoustics in the background, really low in the mix. They just kind of add texture. Um, it's great, more great distortion, a very aggressive distortion in the chorus. Um, love the interplay between the bass and the drums and the turnaround. Um, and the reverb on the vocal and the chorus just makes it huge. And it ends with these ooh, ooh, oohs, which kind of don't fit, but they do. <laughs> and I thought they were going for a, a dinosaur junior. Uh, reference with the title because that's really what this one reminded me of um it's like dinosaur jr only the lyrics are easier to understand than <laughs> dinosaur jr because who the fuck can ever understand what that guy's saying oh yeah uh, <laughs> but no this is a good rocker you know just straight out rocker mm -hmm. um track four carnival um this one is about looking down at the world literally from a ferris wheel sneering and just waiting for you know waiting for fantasizing about that one person who will get you and give you hope <laughs> in the future. Very relatable adolescent fantasy. I, I did not go for the translation of the lyrics. I was just going uh -huh. first for, for whatever they could. This kind of one, they Sounds kind like of lost me. like your mic fell down. Oh, 
Yeah, I think I accidentally brushed up. I was gesturing, I think, while talking, and that was that. I apologize. Mm. But this one uh, is kind of where they they started losing me a little bit here because it was well. First, I was hoping for a Mr. Bungle cover, but no. Um, then I realized the intro is you know Nirvana's you know I think I'm dumb, but that's very brief. They go into a different song after that, and I think that's the problem with it. It kind of feels like they're cobbling pieces together which i get that's how you can write songs but it's the way actually, they're doing it here this is my favorite on the album because of that it goes through all of these transitions in these different sections um i love how it builds like that the opening riff has uh, some great i love the opening riff and the vocal harmonies and just how busy it gets when all the other instruments come in and then it's just it is about four different songs in one i just don't think they i mean they don't really flow together though it's just kind of like okay we had this piece here and then the, i mean it, it doesn't take long to figure out that's what they did i like the harm and you know i like the harmonies in mm. every other song but it, they didn't really work for me in this one uh, it's just too much tack together I, I i like the kind of winding riff that p chan's playing in the verse um and then it just explodes when it gets to the chorus another great some great feedback squeals is ragged solo um and then another it's, much more composed solo it's funny that this i think is before interpol mm -hmm. you know and i think they took a lot of their sound from this interesting um yeah and i, I, I love p chan's playing it's just so tasteful and melodic and just doesn't play a lot of notes just the right ones and he experiments a lot um on to track five our love and peace this is just kind of about wishing for and hoping for love and peace as the 20th century ends. Bear in mind, 99. Um, this one's a lot like Rush's uh, Tears. It's the one band I... A lot of bands you're talking about, I can see the analogy. Um, Rush is not someone I would have ever connected to the pillows. Well, I mean, Tears, I think, is a, you know, a very atypical Rush song, yeah, fair. Really, honestly. But I, I think... This one just is very similar to it. Mm -hmm. um, love the off kilter groove. There's some great wah guitar going on on the left, um, and I know that's kind of a cliche these days because all the metal players use a wah when they solo. Mm -hmm. But Pichan's right. um, doing some really interesting stuff over the vocal with this one, um, and I love how long Sawao holds the C in peace. Um, chorus comes in and it's big without any distortion, which is. A hard trick to pull off because it's easy to just step on a distortion pedal and get big. Yeah, they they go in big without distortion. Um, and the Ringo influence on Shin Chan comes out really well in this one. Um, there is kind of an odd lyric though. Um, at one point it says, "Um, it's what the setting star, it's what the set, setting star judges over a word, love and peace, p i e c e." Um, the yeah. only line that doesn't really fit into the lyric. Um. But I, I love the interplay between the three guitars and the solo. You've got the riff on the right side, the kind of wah accents continuing, and then this short, sparse wah heavy solo. I just I love how they work guitars together and inter, you know compose them. On to track yeah, I six. Think, hmm? I think Corgan. It's funny. I think they took Pumpkin's sound, and then I think Corgan kind of took this sound and came back with Swan. <laughs> Like a, a couple of years later when he was looking to do something different. It's possible. I mean, this is the, this is around the period where they got most, you know, the, their biggest push. So yeah. it's certainly it's possible that they would have been heard. Um, on to track six, Crazy Sunshine. Typical adolescent, adults don't understand and someday we'll be free <laughs> to live like I want it, like we want it. Um, this is the weakest, even though it's from Fully Cooly, um, I think I'm just too familiar with it. It's the one that's most associated with the show. Um, I do like I, the groove. I'm on the fence. I mean, it. I think it's... I, I really like the chorus. The mm -hmm. verses don't really grab me, but the chorus and the harmonies, I mean, has such a great bad religion feel to it. Yeah. But of course, it it's telling, though. I, I mean, I've seen some of Fooly Cooly and don't really remember... Oh, well, this is at the, in the it, toward the end or the climax. Oh, OK. OK. In. Um, and it's in a lot of advertisements. You stay, they go to this song because it's it's I guess it's the most grabbing. 
Um, I do like how it softens in the pre-chorus just before the verse comes in huge. Um, nice chaotic solo really dripping with reverb. It's a song that it's hard for me to hear without hearing clips from the show. Oh. And so it's that ingrained in my head, so I'm just kind of tired of it. But yeah, this this is something that Bad Religion should cover. <laughs> um, on to track seven, Backseat Dog, about an unrequited crush. Um, <laughs> I loved the line, uh, supporting actors love. Um, and it's, you know, it's basically uh, 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 affection from someone you barely know exists. <laughs> um, it, it's nice to hear the bass, you know, take... <laughs> prominence in, in this you know yeah. everything else was just kind of you know that that grunge right. kind of feel or arena feel but just to have a song that's going off bass like this right um i also like the lyric that the title was based on of course i'm again i'm pulling from a translation i could easily erase myself away but i'm still tied up in your garden just like a howling dog um <laughs> Great off kilter riff. It is very Pixies. Right. Um, it's funny. I write my notes. Wow, well, there's a little Pixies going on here. And then the end kicks in where they actually yeah. start singing, Here Comes Your Man. At the very end of the fade out. So Wow sings, Here Comes Your Man over the riff. Because right. it's kind of like, well, you're all thinking it. So it was a very nice touch, I thought. Because yeah. I was like, Yeah, I mean, come on, man. You're just fucking. Yeah, okay. I actually AB'd the riffs. They're actually not that similar. Really? Rhythmically, they are. Melodically, they're not. Um, like, it's I mean, Melody, obviously... he, he's singing Here Comes Your Man and just in, with different lyrics, you know? But, I mean, there's it's clearly an influence, you know, which is why he's, he broke into it at the end, but he didn't, like, rip it off. Um, I also love how PGN accents during the uh, verses. He's a true lead player because he doesn't just, like, wait until his solos he actually yeah. plays you know leads and accents during the verses and you know does something interesting um yeah love how melodic june gets on this um and so wow actually plays the solo he usually plays rhythm but he does play the solo in this one i watched a live version of it this morning and he, yeah, he played the solo there i compared it to the studio and it, it does sound like him and i have I to admit i was dancing pick... a bit to this one i i was set to pick this for strongest and then i was actually surprised that they, okay. they beat it you know, mm-hmm. later on. <laughs> on to track eight. Speaking of the Pixies, Kim yeah. Deal. It, uh, it, was, it made sense to go from yeah, here to of there. Course. Uh, apparently, Sawau had a bit of a thing for Kim Deal, Kim Deal back in the day. Frankly, who among us did And didn't? why not? Right. <laughs> um, love the kind of hum we get on the left. I think it's coming from one of the distortion pedals, but it just kind of adds this little extra noise to it. I, I love and the kind of high chords on the right, um, nice snappy snare, kind of so, sounds almost electric or electronic. Um, some great kind of ghostly cor- bo- harmonies on the chorus on the please sing for me part. Um, the and and on the leads at the end of the chorus. Um, love the solo after the first chorus. It's like a chord solo, um, and how the groove kind of picks up a little bit. Um, and the actual solo is kind of low, which is unusual. You know, you didn't, you didn't go for the high end on it. Right, I I think they kind of they kind of play middle of the road here, you know. I was expecting more of a, a Pixies or Breeder sound, mm-hmm. uh, but I guess that wouldn't have been much of a tribute. No, no. Um, so that reminds like, me more of like Foo Fighters or something the, like that. Were the Breeders around at this point? Had they started yet in '99? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I think sure. Bre- I, I Cannonball. That was like that was like '94, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Okay, so yeah. the Pixies were way earlier than that. Yeah, because they were more late. Oh, 80s. right, right. Yeah, Pixies were were pretty much very little known in their own time. Yeah. It wasn't until later right. that yeah, because you know, I think yeah, they were late eighties because I vaguely remember. I think the first time I ever heard a full Pixies song was in high school, um, on the PA. You know, when like during the morning address or something, somebody played "Monkey wow. Gone to Heaven." Huh. Yeah, I yeah listened to 106.3, which went back when it was an alternative station mm-hmm. uh, at uh, at the sh- Jersey Shore, at least. Right. And they would play up every now and again. And I watched 120 Minutes right. on MTV. Um, on to track nine, Funny Bunny, another favorite of mine. Um, just so while looking back on a past relationship that apparently her father didn't approve of and <laughs> just wondering what happened to her. Um well, the line that gives me the father part is uh, defying the voice of the king. You were laughing the night uh, you were found out. 
on top of a hill outstretched by an aurora. Arms outstretched, you invited me. Uh, uh, touched by an aurora. Um, it's just a um, nice melodic, obviously a love song. You don't even need the lyrics to know that. Yeah. Um, love the drum break in the beginning. This is one that June really carries, the bass. The riff is entirely in the bass. Yeah, this is... I, this reminds me a lot of like melancholy and infinite sadness, <laughs> you know, era of pumpkins. Um, and the ending, the lyric at the ending is, gets kind of sad. Um, Even if I can't fly, I'm okay. The ground goes on anyway. Um, so you know, they, they parted company cause she wanted to, you know, pursue her dreams and he's just looking back and saying, well, I, I, it's okay. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> love the nice sparse tasteful solo. Um, although it gets, does get a little ragged, which is a nice touch in this pretty ballad. Um, on to track 10, beautiful morning with you. Overdramatic love song is overdramatic. It's all I have to say about the lyric. <laughs> Uh, you know, at first, my copy only had it as Beautiful Morning, so I'm like, mm. is this a cover of The Rascals? Nice, nice. <laughs> and you know what? The two actually work well together, Beautiful Morning and Beautiful Morning with you. Oh, sure thing. <laughs> this is more of a hyped up version of that, of course, because Beautiful Morning is just, mm. you know, a very right. relaxing song. Right. Uh, and but... in this case, the music matches the drama of the lyrics. It's just this dir- death, dirge-like, slow, plodding song in the verses. And P-Chan does some really fascinating effects. This is basically just P-Chan playing with his effects rack <laughs> over this dirge-like song. At least, again, in the verses. And the the beginning, it takes a while for the lyrics to come in. So it just right. kinda, it's just boom, boom. That just... The tension just builds beautifully until the lyric comes in. I mean, it's definitely of its era, you know. You could. This is definitely like a late '90s, mm-hmm. you know, rock song. Yeah, yeah. The harmonies, though, are definitely some of their their best. Yeah. And and uh, this is fast growing into one of my favorites. And it, it this one, I think, uh, more than anything, should have been a hit mm-hmm. back in the in the day, even even though it's not in English entirely. And I love how the, the pre-chorus just explodes and the chorus just heightens that. Um, and how simple and present the bass is. He's just playing one note, hitting it twice in the verse, but it's loud as hell. Um, and, and you know, his parts leading up, to, P-Chan's parts leading up to verse two, he does some effects work that is, I think it's just a simple pick slide, but the effect he has on it just makes it spine chilling. Um, Great solos, too. Not many notes, but just really nice and celebratory. Yeah. There is an odd lyric, though. Um, in the, I think it's the second half of the first verse. Um, I won't force you to touch me. We're so madly in love that even if this, even if you should hurt me, it's all right. I will take all the pain. <laughs> What's odd about that lyric, actually? <laughs> you know, overdramatic love song is overdramatic. I just, yes. I won't force you to touch me. Part like in twenty twenty for through twenty twenty eyes that line's a little rapey but it, like in ninety nine you know uh, no no he's saying he won't force you yeah still feels a little rapey um <laughs> on to track eleven which I'm guessing is your favorite yes um <laughs> advice this is just a teach a, a teenager being told off by authority figures and it's the only song in that's completely in English they do usually one song entirely in English per album. It's and, just, uh, go ahead. It's not even lyric, the lyrics that, that suck me in. It, it's mm-hmm. just, I mean, them going for their buzzcocks, you know. Loud, <laughs> fun punk grand. song. Yeah. I, I I wish they had done more of this throughout the album, honestly. <laughs> and I love how the drums follow the riff at first and all the characters he pulls out in the vocal. The yeah. vocal is all over the place, vo- you know, gymnastic yeah. almost at points. Um, cause he's playing all of these different characters. They were, they were kind of telling off the kid. Um, great reverb on some of the vocal lines as well. Um, and the solo is just, so wow, using a sound effect, um, like one chord, just kind of grating <laughs> over the, the band. 
Um, and I love the thank you at the end. Yes. <laughs> Hope we pass the audition. <laughs> <laughs> So this is usually a foregone conclusion when we get to this point, but I honestly don't know where you're going this time. Do you recommend it? This one went all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> That's why. I mean, this uh, this started out strong. I think there were some valleys along the way, but I think I think there's strong songs here that, that yeah, I'd recommend it. And I strenuously recommend it. I mean, admittedly, it's a it's one of the fully coolie songs, so I'm not super objective if you're not familiar with with the other our other show. I fully coolie is pretty much my favorite thing in the world. So, you know, the band that did the music for it, I absolutely adore. And I think this is probably my favorite album of theirs. Um it took them a few albums to really find their sound. Um with Kenji Oeda, they were jangle pop. Like, yeah. typical, very 60s, influenced, early 90s band. Um, he left. They did a couple of jazz albums. <laughs> That's like, cool. very jazz influenced, like, very loungy. And um, jangle pop can really work, too, if it's done well, so, you know. Yeah. Um, and then they did Lost Man, which is kind of leaning into alternative, but very poppy, except for Stalker. And then they get to the Fully Cool Al- albums, and they kind of subtly refine their sound to this. And it's really the, the sound they still have today, you know, 30, 20 years later. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I strenuously recommend it. Um, that's it for Happy Bivouac. Until next time, we'll be reviewing Spring Session M by Missing Persons. Oh, wow. I always remember, I forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are. Thank <music> you.